I'm Jeff Davis, taking you on the wine road. Today's adventure will be my full show of our trip to Lake County, which is located northwest of Napa Valley. You know that it's going to last 10 years, but you, you kind of want to see it. And when we opened it, it was a remarkable experience. And it gave us a great deal of confidence that, that what's in all our, our club members' cellars is going to show well for years. We're the northernmost point of the Mayakama Mountains, which run right through Napa Valley, right on up to Lake County. Unforgiven volcanic soil, smoking hot days, cool nights. So the complexity is just out of sight. <laughs> Great. I, 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 if I were in Napa and all I made was Cabernet, I mean, you know, I mean, it almost seems a little boring to me, you know. We really get to pick and choose sort of the cream of the crop and really have a creative expression of what we, you know, want to show off for each brand. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jeff Davis. As you hear my interviews with Six Sigma Ranch, Hawk and Horse Vineyards, Steel Wines, and Shannon Ridge Winery, you'll learn thoughtful farming practices are commonplace in Lake County. Many are organic and even go to the extremes of being biodynamic, which takes time to develop. Lake County is rural, less populated, and many of the wineries are just minutes from each other, but the area is quite spread out from the south to the north of Clear Lake. As you travel from one end to the other, you'll see some beautiful scenery. You'll come across some signs of last year's devastating fires, but not as much as you would expect, and they don't like to talk much about it, leaving that topic to the past. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. We'll start out today in Lower Lake at Six Sigma Ranch, owned and operated by Kai Allman and family. Kai grew up in Denmark, so you'll hear his accent. Six Sigma is a working ranch, and though Kai spent his adult life in the corporate world, farming comes naturally to him and his son Christian as they spent their childhood working and appreciating the land. I started by asking Kai to explain the meaning behind Six Sigma. It's a business process for uh, constant improvement used by big companies. Uh, I helped introduce it at General Electric. And the key to it is that you, uh, in the different steps of what you're doing, get data around it. A lot of people will say, well, we offer excellent service, but that doesn't really mean anything. But if you say that we offer excellent telephone service because we pick up the phone before the search ring, then you have a data point around it. And uh, you basically try to be very consistent in what you deliver, and you can describe that in every step of, of what you do. Well, obviously my next question is, what level have you reached here? <laughs> I would say maybe five. Maybe five. So we still have a way to go. So six is the, the, the goal you're the reaching goal for. Us. That's our goal, yeah. What an interesting history you have here, and I love some of the detail that you have on your website. It's nice that you provide that. Well, it's it's a fascinating place. And California is fascinating. I mean, uh, it was back in 1850, uh, the only state out here. Everything from here and back to Missouri was federal territory. Uh, my wife uh, found all the original settlements, uh, GPS them in on a map, and uh, basically wrote the story. So she published a book a couple of years ago, and talk about the different families that came out here, how they got out here. And your tasting room is the old stagecoach stop. It was uh, on the way out to Knoxville. There's uh, this one here. Knoxville is about 16 miles out. And they normally had these stops with 10 miles distance in between them. The next one is 10 miles out. Unfortunately, it burned down to the ground. The only thing standing is the fireplace, and it looks exactly like the one you see over the, huh. the tasting room. Right. Your flagship wine is Tempranillo, but you craft some others as well, but you really love that Tempranillo grape. And you were telling me the story a little while ago about how you came to love that and how you were introduced to it. That was in Spain back in 1975. Uh, and it worked hot the first day with a very nice gentleman, Francesco Molinari. At the end of the day, he said, uh, do you have any dinner plans? And I said, not really. So far, you're the only person I know in Spain. I'm here for the first time. Okay, do you like seafood? I said, sure. Let's go to a nice seafood restaurant, El Pescador. You know, the European tradition is that you drink white wine with seafood and red wine with meat. Mm-hmm. So he says, you have to understand one thing about Spain. The best white wines are red, so I'm going to order Timpanillo. So that was the start of a love affair. <laughs> <laughs> that turned on the switch in your head, huh? Uh, yeah, and uh, 
my son Christian here had to fly over when we first started production and visit a lot of wineries with our winemaker. And you spent three weeks over there, right? Yeah, the, the Spanish have worked on Tempranillo for 400 years and have learned a lot of things. So it, it's fair to, to go check how they do it. Uh, in California, they've done Tempranillo for about 30 years, and there are a couple of, of good ones, and there are a few excellent ones. The reason it works for us here is because we have really warm days in the summer that are dry and then really cool nights. You can grow decent Tempranillo most places in wine country, but you have to have that hot day, cool night, because you protect the acidity, and then you get a, a proper balance in the wine. So Lake County has that unique balance, the same way that Rioja and Toro and Ribera de Duero have that balance. So it's a, it's a real home run here. And then, of course, going over to learn some of their practices and, and apply our American footprint on top of those uh, was the way that we, we built the wine that, that has since been recognized as, as a real Tempranillo winner in, in America. And you really treat it with uh, respect and give it a lot of aging. Yeah, we uh, we age it for two years in, in new French oak, and, and then after that we age it for a year in the bottle before we release it. And uh, we, we opened the 05, the original, for Christmas the other day uh, to try it at the 10-year anniversary, and it was it was just awesome. You know, you, you, you know that it's going to last 10 years, but you, you kind of want to see it, and when we opened it, it was, it was an, a remarkable experience, and it gave us a great deal of confidence that that what's in all our, our club members' cellars is going to show well for years. Yeah. And surprisingly, in that same vineyard, a little bit higher elevation, you're growing Pinot Noir. We, we do have two acres of Pinot, and, and in Lake County, Pinot is obviously not, not a common thing because typically Pinot is in cooler coastal climates. And it started because my father said, hey, I, I would like to grow some Pinot, and, and the rest of us, of course, said, well... That's that's a little little crazy because we're in Lake County. Did you say what property are you going to buy to do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, I own the place and we're growing Pinot. So I said, fine. And, and we put it in. And somewhat to my surprise, the product has actually been excellent. And the reason is that it's up at the top of the hill. There's a little bit of a, a breeze down from Lake Berryessa on a hot day. Uh, we've won several competitions with it, and, and it's 200 cases a year. Uh, we don't distribute it, and it's entirely sold out all the way until October. So so the proof is in, in the fact that people really enjoy the wine. I'm talking with Kai and Christian Allman of Six Sigma Ranch. A fun option they offer is a pin scour tour, one of those old six-wheel all-terrain military vehicles that you take through the ranch up to their mountaintop vineyard to do a tasting, and it's quite an experience. It's the best way to see the ranch. It's a, an Austrian truck with six wheels. We can fit uh, we can fit ten people in it, and we run them every weekend on 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 a schedule. So it goes up into the vineyard. We get to see the pastured pork, the pastured cattle, and of course the the Tempranillo grapes and a great view. And and then we sample the wine at the top of the vineyard that's grown in the vineyard. And the fun aspect of that is that everyone knows that wines pick up their surroundings. They, the, the plants breathe, they take in, in uh, oxygen and, and CO2 and spit out oxygen and CO2 and, and, and so the air goes through the leaves and they pick up the, the pine, the smells of, the, of the, the cover crops and the clovers and, and everything in the vineyard. So if you stand at the top of the vineyard and sample that wine where it was grown, you can tell the connection between the two. The, the, mm. the environment influenced the grapes. And uh, we're sitting here in the middle of a uh, 4,300-acre working ranch, and it's very important for us uh, to give people that real working ranch experience as opposed to just another tasting room because we can't, we can't co- there are wonderful tasting rooms in California, uh, but we can't compete with that and we're not trying to. We, we, we prefer to have our own concept here. And they certainly do. I'll return with Kai and Christian and learn more about Six Sigma Ranch when On the Wine Road continues. I'm Jeff Davis and this is On the Wine Road. Today's adventure takes us to Lake County. I'm continuing my conversation with Kai and Christian Allman of Six Sigma Ranch. We were just talking about how it's a real working ranch, and I commented that I'm fairly sure it's the only winery I've seen that has a page entitled Meat on their website. It's an old cattle ranch, so we started with beef. Uh, We raised a couple cows just to dabble in it, and also because cow manure makes great vineyard fertilizer. 
it's it's good to to grow organic grapes and we we certainly use organic principles but you really need that whole cycle the mm-hmm. the old fashioned farm to to get a proper uh, nutrient cycle so it started with some cattle and club members came in and saw the cattle in the driveway and said hey can we buy meat and we thought well probably probably should be able to buy meat so we started a waiting list for the beef we still have a waiting list it takes about a year to to get meat after you join the list but just so that people wouldn't be upset about it, we do sell some ground beef and, and bacon and uh, ground pork in the tasting room. So that's available by the pound whenever it's in season. Can I see you have lamb too? We do. We, we graze lambs in the vineyards. Um, they, they help us with the weed control and the fertilizer. And then, of course, they, they show up later at the ranch to table dinner. It's, it's sort of an, an old-fashioned, a little bit brutal, but, but very real, uh, real sort of a system. Your, your animals certainly contribute quite a lot to the property, don't they? And uh, I was raised that way. My grandfather was a farmer, and I spent a lot of time on his farm. I was wondering about that. And uh, if, if you had told him that he was organic, he would have said, what's that? Yeah. But of course he used the manure in the fall and took it out to the field, and he, he never went to a store where he bought anything uh, poisonous. Yeah. Uh, everything was just done the natural way. So that was the way I, I was raised. And I still remember when we uh, slaughtered our first pig here and I tasted the meat. I could literally see my grandfather's farm. That was that taste coming back. It was a wonderful moment. Yeah. I think his grandfather would be proud of how they're applying what they learned from the past to the ranch and vineyards at Six Sigma Ranch. And I'd say they're close to attaining that Six Sigma level of optimum operation. That was Kai and Christian Allman. Learn more about them, their truly enjoyable wines, and historic property at SixSigmaRanch.com. Now we're going to chat with Mitch and Tracy Hawkins of Hawk and Horse Vineyards. We had planned to meet up while my wife and I were traveling through Lake County, but sadly they had to postpone. But I wanted to get them on the show today, so we spoke by phone. They were both on the line, so I asked, how are you going to know who's going to answer which question? We got it all figured out already, brother. <laughs> We're here and we just wink at each other. <laughs> oh, that's a great way to do it. Uh-huh. Okay. So like most vineyard properties out there, this was a ranch at one time, and I see you have horses, which of course uh, the name suggests, and other animals as well. That's right. Actually, the horse part was a natural part of the ranch before we bought it. It had been an Arabian horse breeding facility in the 60s and 70s. Um, By the time we came on the scene in the 80s with my family, it had been sort of run down and dilapidated, so we polished it up, and we really like to keep that sort of um, American, Western theme um, to our property. It's very much what what was there, and and we love it. They're so enjoyable, and I haven't ridden in a while, but uh, I always enjoy that opportunity to ride a horse. Now, Tracy will not tell you, but my two youngest daughters and my wife, Tracy, are both uh, competition barrel racers. So uh-huh. we're very active in barrel racing, cutting, as well as other rodeo events. Oh, great. Now, what were you two, aside from maybe doing that, what were you two doing before you got into this wine business? I think we were both kind of in the restaurant business, and uh, we were both going to answer at the same time on that one. Well, I mean, I think we started out in the restaurant business uh, sort of college and and shortly post-college days, but um, when Mitch and I met, he was running um, a 300-acre ranch in Knights Valley that was gorgeous with horses and hundreds of olive trees, and I was working in sales and marketing for a winery in Sonoma County, so it was kind of a good match, and my family had had this property for many years. Well, yeah, it sounds like Mitch had uh, some experience going already and a natural step for you. Oh, I, I'm a farm boy from way back, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you even kind of sound like one. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't Unless know that I'm I mean. in Las Vegas selling wine, and then I try to uh, class it up a little more. <laughs> yeah, because Vegas requires a lot of class. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. So you have some elevation there. You're about 1,800 to 2,200 feet, huh? Exactly. So we've, we're the northernmost point of the Mayakama Mountains, which run right through Napa Valley, right on up to Lake County, high elevation, unforgiven volcanic soils, smoking hot days, cool nights. We're getting about two, two and a half tons per acre, tiny, tiny clusters, thick, thick skins. So the complexity is just out of sight. Yeah, the vines may not like that kind of environment, but they sure do well there, don't they? They thrive and survive, yes. 
they sure do. I mean, it was I couldn't dream up a better site than where we're at. And surely you're both proud of the fact that, and, and Tracy touched upon this, that you're certified biodynamic. Now, do you work within the moon cycles and planting animal horns and all that sort of thing? Oh, absolutely everything. I mean, that's who we are for sure. And uh, I must admit, way back in the day, we're talking years and years ago, Tracy's the one that brought me on board with this. She knew all about it. Let you, me jump in right here. Please. Mitch didn't see me wink. It's my turn. No. <laughs> you mentioned planting um, animal horns. It is a common misconception. So one of the, re- one of the sort of um, ideas uh, behind biodynamic farming, farming is to aim for a closed system. So we try to source as much as we can uh, from our ranch um, to enliven the vineyard. So that's why we keep the Scottish Highland cattle. We source our own compost. But we also do specialized biodynamic preps, and one of those is where you actually ferment um, cow dung from a pregnant or lactating uh, cow in the soil over the winter. And so speaking to your moon cycles, it's also seasonal. So the soil during the winter is alive with microbes and bacteria, worms, and things like that. So when we bury this manure in the earth during the winter, it really becomes transformed into something different that is a fortified um, compost, which we make into a tea, sort of like a probiotic for the soil to help the vines take up more of what's already there. So it's not as mystical as it might seem. There's actually a reason why we put the horns in the soil at a certain time. This is not done in the vineyard, by the way. The horns are buried in the cow pasture. They went on to explain further about that process for another couple of minutes. Needless to say, it takes a lot of work to be biodynamic, but they know it's well worth it. I was deeply impressed and surprised when I learned that their winemaker is the esteemed longtime Napa viticulturalist and winemaker, Dr. Richard Peterson. He started at E&J Gallo in the 50s. He worked with Andre Chelischeff at Bull U Vineyards, at Scream and Eagle, and has a Ph.D. in agriculture chemistry. I asked, how the heck did you land him as your winemaker? I got to tell you, it was, it was just uh, luck. It was, I think that uh, one of my first introductions to him was delivering some firewood and uh, just having a great conversation, and I just kept coming back. I just kept coming back, and uh, he's one of those kind of guys where uh, he doesn't just give you the answer. He made me learn the Pearson Square. He made me learn how to do the mathematical equation of how much high proof to add. And he has four daughters. He doesn't have a son. And I kind of like to think that uh, maybe I just kind of self-appointed myself as uh, his new son. Not a bad uh, family to get yourself into. (laughs) Oh, he's he's just a great guy. In fact, I had no idea of really uh, his vast experience and wealth of knowledge who he was. We just hit it off from the from day one. His daughter Heidi, Heidi Barrett, does very well. Now her daughters are uh, also in the business and uh, she's married to uh, Bo Barrett at Chateau Montalena, so they have quite a, uh, a lineage there. That's right. It's, it's quite, a, quite a family. So you bottle primarily Cabernet Sauvignon. That's right. We chose Cabernet Sauvignon because um, our founding partner and myself really love it. It's one of our favorite, um, the Bordeaux-style reds. We also chose it because it is perfectly suited to our gorgeous, mountainous uh, soils. Mm-hmm. Well, I imagine it has just incredible flavor. Now tell me about the, uh, the Latigo dessert wine. So much is pointing to me again. The Latigo is uh, a port-style dessert wine. It is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, harvested a little bit later than the uh, uh, Cabernet wine that we produce. Mm-hmm so that we get very concentrated flavors. We're bringing the fruit in dimpled and raisiny. Um, We begin the fermentation, and then we fortify with high-proof brandy. This is what separates it from a regular dessert wine. It is a fortified port-style wine because of that addition of brandy. So what you get is something that is very full-bodied, rich, opulent, extremely velvety, very aromatic, um, sweet leather, pipe tobacco aromas. It's fabulous. I love to pair this with uh, rich, creamy cheeses or bittersweet chocolate. Yeah, boy, I wish I was uh, with you in person so we could be tasting that because it sounds delicious. Now tell us about your tours. You give visitors and your wine club members a chance to see the ranch. 
We do, and we and we are by appointment only, since it's just Tracy and I that are giving the tours. And so we encourage people to go ahead and make an appointment. We meet you at the tasting room on the 1,340-acre ranch. And uh, what I like to do is just throw them in the truck and drive them out to the vineyard, walk the vineyard, talk about what's going on at that time of season, find a Lake County Diamond or so. I think the hardest part of that part of the tour is is that uh, sometimes I disappear with the people for an hour and a half, two hours, while Tracy's waiting in the tasting room with the beautiful uh, wines and food pairings. And Tracy will always have like an old uh, library reserve and the current releases, a little Latigo. You're on our little patio right there overlooking our beautiful uh, quarter horses. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It sounds like a great experience for a few hours. Yeah, like you said, yeah. It's well, I'm be. chiming in again. It's supposed to be 45 minutes to an hour, so we're we're working on Mitch. Getting He just loves and really enjoys. I think that we enjoy the tours as much as the guests because it gives us a moment to step outside of our work-a-day world and really enjoy the ranch and vineyard ourselves. That's great. Well, I'm looking forward to coming out there and seeing the place for myself next time uh, we're in Lake County, and uh, I really appreciate your time and telling us about Hawk and Horse Vineyard. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you. I can't wait to have you. Have you ever seen that show, Fixer Upper, from Waco on HGTV? I think Mitch and Tracy are Lake County's equivalent to Chip and Joanna on that show. A very entertaining couple. Find out more about what they do at hawkandhorsevineyards.com. Up next, a man who helped launch some very successful wineries, then went out on his own as we continue on the wine road. Welcome back to On the Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. On today's show, we're featuring wineries from Lake County. Still to come, Joy from Shannon Ridge Winery. Right now, it's my conversation with a guy who's been at it for quite a while. Jed Steele helped start the wine programs at Ed Mead's in Anderson Valley and Kendall Jackson when they began in Lake County. In 1991, he went out on his own with Steele Wines in Kelseyville and hasn't looked back. I joined them on a picnic bench on the lawn of their tasting room and winery and started by saying, if my math is correct, you've been making wine for nearly 50 years. I know, incredible. Yeah, yeah, who would have thunk? But yeah, I started out working in uh, Napa Valley for Stony Hill Winery, a small winery that specialized in uh, Chardonnay. You know, I have to say, you hardly look much older than 50 years old. Oh, well, seeing that this is on radio, that can't be confirmed by your listeners. <laughs> but thank you for the compliment. I mean, sure, you have gray hair, but then so do I. So. Well, I don't have any hair, hardly. <laughs> so what year, you started at Ed Mead's, about, what, 72? Well, I, after Stony Hill, I sort of bounced around, actually worked in a, a lot of restaurants. But then uh, in 72, uh, went back to Davis and got a master's degree. After working at Stony Hill, I thought it was interesting uh, as far as a profession. But you got to realize, and, you know, I remember Bob Trinchero telling me in the 70s, you know, at Sutter Home, that, you know, uh, his generation, the parents were always saying, you know, get out, this goes back to the 60s, and, you know, get out of the wine business because there's no future in it, you know. And uh, they said, go to medical school or dental school or be, go be a lawyer, or do something like that. And he said, now I've got all these doctors and lawyers and dentists that want to be winemakers <laughs> so things had shifted but uh, in the late 60s I really didn't see a lot of potential as far as a vocation but that changed dramatically and then in 72 I said hey this could be good and there was a real cry for winemakers so there being a lack of and so I decided to go back to Davis and I got a master's and 74 I was at Ed Mead's, uh in Anderson Valley and did that for nine years it must have been uh quite remote even at that time uh, maybe Hush was out there and Navarro uh, Hush was there and Ed Meads then Navarro uh, Ted Bennett was actually a partner in Ed Meads and a few years after that we started I started working with him on Navarro uh, but yeah he was pioneering it was uh, very exciting and from there you went to Kendall Jackson and hooked up with Jess Jackson to kickstart that program yes that's right yeah he had had some problems uh with his first vintage, and Paul Dolan from it was at Fetzer at the time was a friend of mine, and he said, "You know, this guy really needs some help." So I came over to Lake County and uh, 
hooked up with them, and the rest is history. Yeah, yeah they were based here originally. Yeah, it was not even a mile down the road from us right now. And I, did I hear there's a story about why uh, you left Kendall Jackson and now you're here on your own? <laughs> <laughs> My sordid past surfaces. Well, I actually, uh, you know, again, you know, I mean, I was just, you know, more or less a hippie, you know, from Mendocino. And we started Kendall Jackson. We did about 30,000 cases the first year. And the goal was to make 72,000 cases and level off. And That was pretty big for that time, wasn't it? It was fairly big. Yes, it was fairly big. Um, but the goal, uh, the original business plan was to go to 72,000 cases, and that would be it. Uh-huh. Uh, but nine years later, we were making over a million cases. And uh, the environment became uh, difficult for me to work in, only because it became extremely corporate and extremely, you know, I, I started to go to more budget meetings than winemaking meetings, mm-hmm. that kind of story, which happens, you know, the price of success. And I just decided to uh, just start my own thing and sort of, you know. Well, here you're making a vast amount of varietals in your bottling. And, uh, but yet they're small enough that you can still keep that handcrafted oh, yeah. ability. Yeah, we make a lot of 200-case lots, 500-case lots. So I mean, if you looked at the number of varietals you're making, well, big warning, but really we're not. We do about 60,000 cases a year. Which again, listeners sometimes uh, that don't know a lot about the wine business think is a lot, but it's really, you know, when you look at wineries like, you know, Kendall Jackson or Fetzer that are making three or four million, uh, you know, 60,000 is really, well, that, they're off exponential. But yeah, it's uh, still pretty hands on operation. Yeah, when I see those kind of numbers, I, I just feel that you must really enjoy the artful crafting of working with different varietals. Oh, yeah, well, you know, it's. <laughs> I, 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 if I were in Napa and all I made was Cabernet, I mean, you know, I mean, it almost seems a little boring to me, you know. And, uh, you know, I came up in an era when, you know, we were fresh out of Davis. There were quite a few of us, and there were a lot of holes in our knowledge, and we would often be hired by, by someone who had planted 40 acres in a given location. They had planted 10 acres of Pinot Noir, 10 acres of Cabernet. 10 acres of Chardonnay and 10 acres of Riesling. And the owner would say, I want to make world-class wines out of all four of these. And obviously, you're not going to get those four varieties to all perform to their best in the same location. You know, Mm -hmm. Pinot Noir country is rarely, if ever, Cabernet country. So, but the advantage of that was that we got, I I think my generation got very well-versed in making a number of different wines, as opposed to now... You go to work for a winery in Napa, and we say, okay, we make Cabernet. Or you go to work Carneros, we make Pinot Noir. Back then, we were expected to know how to make Riesling and know how to make Pinot Noir. So it was a, it was a benefit to that. I'm talking with Jed Steele of Steele Wines. We'll find out the varietals he likes to craft with his own winery when we continue on The Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis, and we are on the wine road in Lake County. We're just outside the town of Kelseyville talking with Jed Steele. In 1991, he left Kendall Jackson to run his own winery. I said, there aren't too many winemakers who have their own winery. You know, know, the reality was that it finally struck me. My wife at the time pointed this out to me very forcefully that I actually started two wineries for other people that both became very successful. And so, you know... Uh, the light bulb finally went off. Well, if I did this for other people, why don't I just do it for myself? So, yeah. yeah. Getting back to your varietals, which are the ones that you find the most fun to work with? Oh, heck. You know, um, I really, the current, the rosé we made, I've made rosé out over the years out of Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, Syrah, Sangiovese, and I'm probably missing a few, but about, I, I've always been a fan of the Cabernet Rosé is from the Loire Valley in France, where they use Cabernet Franc. And Cabernet Franc is one of our strongest red varietals up here. Again, it's a secondary tier. It doesn't get that much publicity, but it really does well for us. And so probably five years ago, I said, you know, we had stopped making rosé, but I said, let's try from Cabernet Franc. And it's just been been great. Mm. It's, well, we, we can have some. I'll have the guys bring some out. All right, I'll try it. Great. <laughs> 
So how much longer do you think you'll be doing this? <laughs> you know, I still enjoy it. I mean, you can't really... It's really hard to find a profession where you grow the grapes, you know, you make the wine, and you actually go out and sell it. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating business. And I, I've made, over the years, friends all around the country, all around the world. So I'm at the point where I, I tend to go places that I like to go. And I still, I'm still i in good health and do it as long as I keep enjoying it. That's Jed Steele of Steele Wines. Here are just a handful of the wines he makes. Barbera, Cunois, Malbec, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, Riesling, Toriga Nacional, a Portuguese variety, and Zinfandel. And that's about half of what he bottles. Find that list yourself and more details at steelwines.com. Now on to the biggest producer in Lake County. Because I was there Memorial Day weekend, I also missed Joy Merrilees at Shannon Ridge Winery, so I caught up with her on the phone as well. Joy is the director of winemaking and production and works with a talented team. I asked her, as the biggest producer in the area, what's your case production these days? We produce uh, roughly about 150,000 cases a year hmm. under six different brands. Yeah, you have a lot of brands, and uh, I guess being the large producer, that allows you to keep your prices low. Uh, you have a considerable list of wines that you bottle, and I didn't see one priced over $32. Yeah, and that's true. We, um, you know, Lake County's been sort of a hard a hard market um, over the years, not getting sort of the recognition that we uh, may or may not deserve. Um, but now, you know, within the last five years, I think people are looking to Lake County, one, for finding quality fruit and also um, recognizing out in the market uh, Lake County as a region that grows really nice Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon specifically, not to mention a, a bunch of other different varieties that we yeah, yeah. as well. Which you also craft. Good list of varieties. This is probably a tough question, but do you have a favorite Variety, yeah, you or? know, everyone says it's like it's like all of your children. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. It's hard to choose, but you know, I I do love Sauvignon Blanc. It's it's one of my favorite varietals to drink and to um, and to produce because it just many different aspects um, depending on the terroir, uh, depending on the yeast you use, depending on how you ferment it, things like that, temperature mm. differences. So Sauvignon Blanc is 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 probably one of my favorites, but I think. Uh, for Lake County, there's a lot of varietals that we do really well. Um, Grenache being one of them, Tempranillo being another, the, the lesser known, uh, you know, fun varieties. Also, Barbera. Right. I'm always happy to come across a Barbera. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your owner, Clay Shannon. When did he establish the winery? Um, our first vintage was 2002. And Clay came from a, a farming background, grew up in Healdsburg, um, and then uh, started his own farming operation um, in I think the late mid to late nineties uh, with Shannon Ranches, and and that's his passion is growing grapes and and farming, and so he um, started farming and and farming for other people. So we not only manage our twelve hundred acres that we own in Lake County, but we also manage probably about five hundred acres of other other owners uh, vineyards in Lake Mendocino, Napa, and Calusa County. So with that, we've had, um, you know, sort of ups and downs over the years. And in 2002, um, you know, the, the market was starting to slow down a little bit for grapes. And so he wanted to have a go at making his own wine. So um, back then, we had a couple of different winemakers and, um, you know, quite a few different varieties that he was trying out just to see what some of the fruit that he was producing tasted like. And so from 2002 until 2007, we kind of dabbled in it, you know, did sell some wine on the bulk market, but also made a few cases here and there. And then 2007 was when we actually put a sales team together, started distributing across the country, and became a full-fledged winery. He must have uh, some good business acumen to grow so quickly, unless he has yeah, a Yeah, we have. We've got a great sales team, and we've got our Fab Five that are across the country, and um, and we've, you know, sort of put the right things in the right place, and, and having all of state-owned fruit, it really helps. That's Joy Merrilees of Shannon Ridge Winery. We'll find out much more about what they have to offer when On the Wine Road continues.
Welcome back to On the Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis, and today we're talking about Lake County. I'm on the phone with Joy Merrilees of Shannon Ridge Winery. In the last segment, she was talking about how their owner, Clay Shannon, started as a farmer. So it doesn't come as a big surprise that their winery leaves a very small carbon footprint by utilizing the Ovis Cycle Sustainable Farming System, which adds to a humorous signature tag on your email, drink wine, eat lamb, wear wool. (laughs) That's the cycle of life there at Shannon Ridge. It is. You know, it's part of our sustainable program. All of our vineyards are certified sustainable through the California Wine Grape um, Sustainable Certification Program. And um, having the sheep in there is sort of just one way for us to um, take that sustainability one step further. So the sheep we put in the vineyards in the fall, just after harvest, and they do a really great job of cleaning up the, the vineyards. They'll, you know, kind of chow down any leftover, you know, sort of leaves that are within reach. They eat all of the weeds underneath. They fertilize for us. They're very low compaction compared to a tractor. And the the weeding that they do um, throughout the season actually saves us from two to three tractor passes a year, which is a huge amount of diesel and labor cost. Hmm. So um, it it is. It's it's sort of a symbiotic relationship in that, um, you know, we are, um, you know, sort of getting the advantages of the sheep. um, And then also, um, you know, by producing sheep as as an extra commodity, um, but then also getting the advantages of the vineyard by keeping our impact low. And in the end, you know, we've got this, this great lamb that, that, you know, provides us with wool for clothing and protein for our families. Yeah, I almost thought you were guys were getting into the textile business with uh, promoting the wool. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's just another sort of side product. We've got to keep these sheep cool during the, the summer months, so they do need to be shorn. And we, you know, we, the wool that we... We don't sell it, you know, privately or anything. It just goes into, I'm not sure what the technical name for it is, but I think it's like the kind of consortium for all of the United States that um, a lot of the wool goes together and, you know, probably gets shipped off to China and turned into carpets and then sells it straight back to us. So I'm not, yeah, but it, it's just, we, we sell it as a byproduct also. Well, sustainable, organic, and biodynamic farming certainly seems to be the prevailing land management up there in Lake County. Yeah, it is. You know, we are able to do all of those three types of farming a lot easier because we don't have uh, disease pressure as much as, um, you know, some of the vineyards to the south of us and, and even to the north of us. Because we're at high elevation, we've got more UV, um, you know, more daylight hours, more uh, growing degree days, and also less fog in the morning. We actually don't get fog in the morning very often at all, maybe one or two days a year. Hmm. And um, the low humidity uh, relieves us of a lot of uh, mildew pressure during harvest and, and just disease and insect pressure throughout the rest of the season. So it's actually easier for us to obtain those, um, those types of farming methods. And it allows you to focus a little more on your winemaking, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us what the tasting room experience is like at Shannon Ridge. It's, um, it's fun. It's so it's up in Lake County. The tasting room is at our Vigilance property, which is on Point Lake View Road and just outside of Lower Lake. And the view is amazing from up there. You kind of look over all of the vineyards, and but down to Anderson Marsh and part of Clear Lake. And so um, just sort of the, the view and the landscape is, is pretty great. We've got, um, you know, bocce court and picnic tables and things like that. But the thing about wine tasting up in Lake County and specifically at Vigilance is it's very casual. There's nothing stuffy about it. We want people to learn about Lake County and learn about the wines that we're producing there. And so, you know, we're very welcoming with open arms and hugs, and and uh, we really just want people to enjoy it and um, and take something away from it. You know, we're not like the the regions around us. We're very different in many different ways. And so, um, you know, sort of embracing people and, and all of the facets from where they come from, we want to just teach them a little bit about what we're doing and, and try to help them to remember that we're all real people, too, and the wine industry is not some untouchable um, sort of market that, you know, it seems can be scary to, to new people or... It can be a little intimidating. Yeah. yeah but, uh, yeah, it's nice to get the word out that there is some wonderful wine being made outside of Napa and Sonoma Valleys and on the uh, peripheral. 
and even further. Ab- yep, absolutely. Go check out someplace new. So you're open Friday through Sunday? 11 to 5. A- appointment needed or no? No. So we're open seasonally um, throughout the summer. So we open uh, first weekend in May and we'll close sometime in October. But yep, 11 to 5, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And yeah, you can just cruise on up and come visit and enjoy the view and taste some wines and have a glass and play some bocce and sort of relax Lake County style. (laughs) And get a hug. And get a hug. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, thanks, Joy. I appreciate your time and uh, congrats on your success there and continued success to you all. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So good talking to you. I appreciate it. If you haven't had a chance to tour through Lake County, be sure to take some time and head over there, do some exploring, and I guarantee you'll be very pleased with the wines they craft. And as I said earlier, the variety of scenery is beautiful. I'm Jeff Davis. Thanks for listening to this episode of On the Wine Road.